So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Leicester Lit and Phil Natural History section. We're very pleased to have uh, with us uh, this evening uh, uh, Leif Bersweden, uh, and he's brought with him a very large audience to hear all about his travels and his exploits uh, in finding uh, or trying to find every orchid native to the British Isles uh, in one very memorable summer. So uh, Leif, uh, over to you, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and thank you all for you know giving up your Wednesday evening to um, hear me talking about orchids. It's one of my favorite things to do. And um, yeah, it's very kind of you all to indulge me. Um, so yeah, The Orchid Hunter, um, this is uh, my book, uh, which came out three, just over three years ago now. Um, and it is very much still my pride and joy. Um, and I'm sort of still getting, still getting used to the idea of being uh, the sole author of a book, um, but it's a lot of fun. And yeah, I would just like to share it with you uh, this evening. Um, so as you probably guessed by now, um, I am a botanist. Um, I've just finished, uh, well, almost finished uh, my PhD at Kew Gardens. Um, I say almost finished because I've still got my Viva to do. Um, so I'm not quite over the line yet, um, but I'm almost there. And I have loved wild plants and nature uh, basically as long as I can remember. Um, just the other day, my mum was reminded, reminding me that um, when I was three years old, I had an imaginary friend called Millie. Uh, but Millie wasn't an ordinary made up girl. Uh, Millie was a leaf on a bush in the garden. And Millie was my best friend. I used to go outside three years old, um, clamber into the hedge and hang out <laughs> with this bush. Um, and I have the, it must be some of my earliest memories um, hanging out with, with, this, with this bush. So as you can tell, I really have loved plants uh, my entire life. But as you can probably imagine, um, my friends at school considered this obsession with, uh, with nature and with plants uh, to be a pretty weird thing. Um, but even they must have thought that I had completely lost it when in the summer after leaving school, uh, instead of you know, jetting off to South America or Thailand or uh, going to Africa to build schools for charity, um, I decided to stay in Britain and Ireland and spend my gap year traveling around the country to try and find all 52 species of wild native orchid in one summer. I still can't say that with a straight face. It's still like a completely ridiculous thing to have done, um, but I absolutely loved doing it. It was so much fun. Uh, and it was something that I really, really needed to do as well. I feel like I got quite a lot of uh, botanical tourism out of my system during that summer. Um, now, our native orchids, uh, they are absolutely extraordinary. I'm sure some of you will have um, seen some of them before or be very aware of them. Hopefully there are a few of you who have never come across an orchid before uh, in the wilds, and so you'll be suitably impressed by all my photos. Um, so just to give you a very brief initial introduction, um, here we have 10 of the 50 or so species. Um, they're just incredible. And you've got flowers here that look like monkeys. You've got flowers which look like bees, like soldiers, like slippers, like lizards, ghosts, butterflies, pyramids. Um, the list goes on. And as I say, these are only, only 10 of them. But the diversity in shapes, colors, forms is just really, really remarkable. And from a very early age, these plants just completely captiv captivated my, my imagination. Now, while I sort of try and teach people about some of the really, really cool biology which is going on with these plants um, in the book, it's not an academic book whatsoever. It's very much aimed at the general public. Um, my sort of life goal is to get more people interested in plants because uh, I think they often fall into the shadow of the animals, um, as, as amazing as the animals are. 
And so, yes, this book is very much, um, you know, meant for the lay person. Any sort of complicated terminology is hopefully well explained. Um, but, you know, you can expect things like uh, there are loads of stories from my childhood, uh, many of which are suitably embarrassing. Um, you can laugh at my complete and utter inability to talk to girls. Uh, there's folklore in there. There's all sorts of um, sort of British plant hunting history. And I guess my sort of uh, thoughts and feelings about how plant hunting can be this really relaxing, um, almost mindful activity. So this evening, what I wanted to do was sort of give you a bit of a flavor for the book. And so I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite orchids. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the really cool biology that uh, they have going on. I'm going to read a couple of extracts from the book um, just to give you, as I say, a bit of a flavor for, for the style and what's going on. Um, and yeah, just kind of like talk about my trip, the adventures I went on and what's inspired the whole thing. So um, here I am aged, I, we worked out I was age four in this photo with my dad who has been this huge inspiration for me getting into nature from a very early age. Um, he took me bird watching. He took me out into the fields behind, behind the house with a homemade sweep net uh, made out of an old bed sheet and a wire frame. Um, and we used to sweep this through the, through the long grass and collect the insects, um, which I then took home in little tubes to identify before letting them back into the garden. But um, it didn't take too long before I sort of began noticing the plants. Um, and in this photo, you can see me sort of inspecting the, the flowers while my dad is looking for beetles. Um, and I think, you know, he's slightly annoyed that I haven't gone for, for birds and beetles, but I think he's generally quite happy that um, I have stuck with natural history. But yeah, people always ask me, you know, like, why, why plants? Why do you like plants? And why, why do you spend all this time trying to teach people about plants rather than animals? And I've never had a, you know, a particularly good answer to that question. Um, the main reason as a, as a young boy, um, the main reason I liked them more was simply because uh, they didn't move. I spent so much time chasing birds and chasing butterflies and dragonflies, and they would always, always, always fly away or run away and, you know, leave me with nothing to look at. And all I wanted to do was just to admire them um, and spend some time sort of, you know, engaging with them, but they all disappeared. But the plants never did that. Um, they were sort of forced, <laughs> forced to sit there while I, while I looked at them. Um, and so, yeah, this sort of interest in botany and plants, um, that was one of the main reasons why I uh, took them on in the first place. Now, over the course of my childhood, um, I acquired various wildflower guides. And um, this page on the right here was hands down my favorite. Um, I remember coming across this group of plants, the orchids, and I just couldn't believe how different they all were, uh, not only to the rest of the plants in the country, but also just to each other. And you can see here, there are what, seven species, all look completely different. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was very much, you know, a botanist in general, but I did have this sort of um, growing passion for our native orchids. And over the course of my childhood, um, I grew up in, in South Wiltshire. I was very lucky to have all sorts of um, wonderful habitats around where I lived. And I was able to explore the local area. Um, my parents are very good at just sort of letting me go off and explore. And I managed to track down about a third of our native orchids. Um, but it always frustrated me that I couldn't see half of these species, which, you know, I'd looked at these pages so often and sort of dreamt up scenarios where I stumbled across them uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and yeah, it was always very frustrating that I couldn't go and see them. Um, and so I think it was about, uh, during my GCSEs when I was about 16, I came up with this plan. Um, I, I found out about gap years. And I was like, oh, I put this, I could have this whole year where I don't have any school, I don't have any work, and I can just do whatever I want. 
Um, and so I thought, right, this is the perfect opportunity. I am going to go and find um, all the orchids that I've never seen before. And then I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to do that, then I may as well try and find all of them in one season. So uh, when the time came, and that's exactly what I did. Um, and I spent the winter before the summer um, sort of planning, basically. And I had this wonderful time. So I, I worked through the winter to, to raise money for, for this trip. And um, yeah, every day I would come home uh, in the evening and I would spend all evening with this huge a, sort of A0 map of the UK, which I'd printed out. And as you can see, I pinned in all the different species. And I spend these evenings just rearranging the pins and like working out where different species grew and trying to plot the sort of perfect route around the country um, that would allow me to fit all of these plants in, in the sort of very uh, busy growing season. Now, as I said previously, I'd seen about a third of these uh, before. And so there were about um, 30 odd species that I'd just never seen before um, outside of the pages of my orchid guides. And, but there were a small subset of these, which I was just really, really, really looking forward to see, to seeing. Um, many of them grow sort of May, June time. And obviously this was a period of time where I was always forced to be in school. Um, often I had to be revising and taking exams and things. Um, so I never had the opportunity to, you know, go to Kent, for example, and um, look for the rare orchids down there. And so one of those right at the top of my list um, was the man orchid, which I just, I just could not believe that there was this plant which has flowers uh, that looked like little people. And it's like something out of a fairy tale. Um, the images of these things, well, as you can see, they're just, it's difficult to believe that these things exist, particularly here in Britain. Um, and so the man orchid was one of those species which I just could not wait um, to go and find. And so in the spirit of um, sort of sharing, uh, giving you a flavor of the book, um, the first of the two short readings which I'm going to do for you this evening um, is about uh, when I first found the man orchid. Um, now, this works very well in, in real life. Um, hopefully it will work well on Zoom as well, um, but we shall see. I guess, you know, I can't see any of you, so you could all be falling asleep. But I just have no idea. Um, equally, I could just be sitting here talking to myself, which is, I'll find out in about half an hour, I guess. Um, okay, so yes, I'm in North Kent. Um, I've just been exploring uh, Jersey and I've flown back uh, to Gatwick and driven to North Kent. Um, and yeah, I visited this nature reserve called Darland Banks, um, which just had the most amazing array of uh, man orchids. Darland Banks is a jewel in the crown of the Kentish countryside. Out on the escarpments, fresh grass is being blown into swells by the breeze, and the warm sun was shining down on the surrounding lemon yellow fields of oil seed rape. Narrow chalky paths wound their way across the hillside then disappeared enticingly into the distance. I moseyed slowly along the bank, exchanging nods of acknowledgement with dog walkers and fellow nature enthusiasts. Some were clearly here for the butterflies, looking for skippers or the flash of a green hair streak. Others, and it was harder to confidently pick them out, were almost certainly orchid hunting. A woman shuffled towards me, her eyes glued to the ground, at the top of the hill, a couple of old blokes wearing khaki jackets and wide brimmed hats were scanning the grassland with methodical precision. These were the botanists, the orchidophiles, in their natural habitat. I joined in, mirroring their purposeful gait, eyes sweeping between milkworts, field madder, and the golden rings of horseshoe vetch. I had been walking for 15 minutes before I came across my first man orchid. Even after a decade of plant hunting, the thrill of a find never wanes. And on this occasion, I was pleasantly surprised by how quickly I had managed to find this subtle limey yellow orchid. The slender spike was crowded with an asparagus tip of flowers, 
each one shaped into a remarkable little man, not unlike the figure on traffic light crossings. Green sepals and petals formed the head and the yellow lip hanging down looked just like the body. The arms and legs were a beautiful burgundy. Each miniature figurine was different. Some were standing stock still, held to eternal attention. Others were frozen in a perpetual stride, while a disturbing number hung limply as if on the gallows. Colloquial English names for this plant are rare, but in France it is aptly, if morbidly, named l'homme pendu, the hanged man. In Germany it is referred to as Puppenorchis, and in Italy as Ballerino. I moved to another part of the bank, about halfway up the hill where dogwood and the white blooms of the wayfaring tree grew among the hedges. The plants here were more typical of those you'd find growing alongside chalk-loving orchids, with swathes of downy oak grass, kidney vetch and yellow rattle. As far as I could tell though, no more orchids. Summer Hayes notes that the man orchid is a somewhat inconspicuous species, which might easily remain unnoticed in an area for a relatively long time. I decided to put this to the test, sitting myself down in the hollow of an old rabbit hole. I waited. At first, nothing happened. The palette of colors remained the same, different shades intermingling with one another as the plants shifted in the breeze. But after a few minutes, I began to notice man orchids. They were lurking behind vetches and buttercups, peering at me from their hiding places. Once I had trained my eye to see them, they appeared more and more frequently and reached further and further from where I sat, like shy children coming out to inspect their parents' dinner guests. I had been sitting just off the path, but jumped when I felt the inquisitive snuffling of a Labrador's nose on the back of my neck. So absorbed in orchid hunting, I hadn't heard its approach, nor its owners, who were only a few meters behind. After a short and somewhat stilted conversation, they told me that most of the men were at the other end of the reserve. Local knowledge was exactly what I needed. Now, I realize that's quite abrupt, but I'm gonna end there just because I will end up reading the whole chapter to you um, and we'll be here forever. Um, but yes, so that's the man orchid. Um, now, growing up with this sort of obsession with, with orchids, with nature, with, with wild plants, um, actually allowed me to bypass many of the trials of adolescence. Um, so instead of spending my time, you know, trying to work up the courage to talk to girls, I spent my entire childhood running around the fields and woods surrounding my house uh, looking for wildflowers which was incredibly fun and much less stressful. Um, my friends teased me mercilessly, of course, uh, all in good humor, um, but their, their jokes largely re revolved around me having lewd relationships with orchids. Um, and appropriately, or perhaps inappropriately, um, orchids have symbolized sex and romance for centuries. And they are sort of very famous for being quite randy themselves. And so now I want to tell you about uh, my very favorite orchid, uh, the bee orchid, which uh, is famous for this uh, incredible pollination mechanism, which is just one of the best things in biology ever. Um, so many of you will have seen this before. It's a relatively common, uh, common orchid found across the country. Um, and yeah, it's sort of one of these sort of flagship orchids, the bee orchid. Um, now it's, yeah, as I say, it's this and, and uh, I don't know how many species there are in the genus, but this and the group of orchids which, of which is a part have evolved this amazing mechanism where they um, exploit the sexual desire of male bees. And so what they do, um, the, the insects which pollinate these, these orchids, um, the males emerge earlier in the spring than the females. So there's this period of time uh, where there are males flying around, but no females. The orchids have sort of timed their flowering period to coincide with this period of time um, where there are males around, but no females. Um, and to the male bee, let's say, uh, to the male bee, um, the flower of a bee orchid looks, smells, and feels 
just like a virgin female bee, which in itself is just amazing. So our male bee, um, has just emerged and he's flying around and he's got one job and um, just find a mate and pass on his genes to the next generation. So he's flying around looking for another bee to mate with. Um, there aren't any females around, but he comes across a population of bee orchids and he sees what he perceives to be um, a female resting on the flower with her head buried amongst the petals. And he thinks, great, this is my lucky day. I've scored. Um, and he flies down, he lands on the flower and still completely convinced that this is a female, uh, he attempts to mate with the flower. Now the bee orchid um, is sort of, you know, sitting there um, as it were. And while the bee is having a great time, um, the bee orchid just drops uh, two sacks of pollen and sticks them to the back of the bee's neck. The bee is completely oblivious to this, has absolutely no idea what's going on. He's on cloud nine, having a great time. But after a while, um, he gets a bit frustrated by the lack of action. And so he buzzes off in search of a more enthusiastic partner. So once again, our male bee is flying around uh, looking for a female. There still aren't any females around. Um, and he comes across a new population of bee orchids. Um, he immediately falls for the ruse all over again. Uh, and in doing so, in, in mating with the next flower, he deposits the pollen from the first one onto the second one and pollinates the orchid. So it's this ingenious, it's so clever, this whole um, mechanism is just extraordinary. Um, and what I love most about it is that um, this whole fraud is masterminded by a plant. And it's always, always good when the plants get one over on the animals. Um, it always seems to be the other way around, but it's great to see. So, um, yeah, that's my favorite orchid. Um, it's actually, it's actually um, interestingly abandoned this mechanism, having just told you that whole story. Um, while the other members of the, of the genus uh, still do this, uh, the bee orchid has for whatever reason, abandoned, abandoned um, this pollination mechanism. We think it's probably because um, the species which pollinated it has died out or perhaps moved to a different orchid. Um, but one way or another, the bee orchid has had to make this drastic lifestyle change um, and it now pollinates itself. Um, so it's doing very well. It might not do so well once the uh, once the climate changes, um, but at the moment it is doing very well. So yes, that's the bee orchid. Now, um, finding these orchids uh, was not always the easiest thing in the world. Um, the flowering season in Britain Island starts in mid-April, usually on average, and ends in sort of early September. And at the beginning of the end, it's relatively easy. Um, there are a few species in flower, usually relatively close to one another, um, and it's pretty easy to do. But in the middle, particularly between sort of mid-May to mid-July, there are orchids flowering everywhere, and it felt like I had to be in 10 different places at the same time. And um, some of them will only flower for a few days to a week. And so fitting them in when they're sort of up at the top of Scotland and down on the south coast um, wasn't always the easiest thing in the world. And orchids are, you know, they're temperamental. They're really fussy. Um, I always describe them as the botanical equivalent of stroppy teenagers um, because as soon as something isn't quite right in their environment, they will go off in a huff and you won't see them for ages. So actually there was an element of, you know, Will this thing even be there when I, when I get there? It might just not be flowering this year. So to give you a sort of an idea of the busyness of it all, I want to show you, I'll just give you an example of, uh, I think this is the first week in July, uh, back in 2013 when I did this. Um, and yeah, this is just one week um, in my, during my summer. So I started the week in South Wales, looking for the fen orchid which is this tiny little green thing. Um, it took me hours and hours and hours to find it uh, in the sand dunes in South Wales, uh, but I did eventually get there. 
Uh, the next day I was back in Wiltshire where I was looking for the bee orchids, which I just told you about. Um, and I found that one outside uh, Salisbury District Hospital, which was a bizarre place to go orchid hunting, but I uh, found about 20 there. The following day I was in Kent where I was looking for the lizard orchid, um, which kind of looks like it's been electrified. It's this really strange plant and it absolutely stinks. Um, most people say it's not too bad, but I just can't stand the smell of it. Um, but I love, I love that there are orchids which smell terrible. Um, I was also down there to find the late spider orchid, which is a close relative of the bee orchid, as you can probably tell. The next day I was in Gloucestershire um, looking for this plant, the red hellebrine, which is one of the rarest orchids in the country. Um, and that year I got very lucky. There were only a few, literally a handful of plants in flower um, at one place in the whole country. Um, they are closed up here. I went back a week later and found them in full flower, but they're in this sort of compound. So I could only see them through binoculars. Um, and then by the end of the week, I had wound my way all the way up to the top of Scotland, uh, to the Outer Hebrides, um, where I was looking for the Hebridean marsh orchid. So as you can see, my journey was a squiggle. Um, I went up and down, round and round, all over the country. And if nothing else, it was just this brilliant way to see Britain and Ireland. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, all this traveling around really took its toll on my car. Um, I very guiltily um, drove about 10,000 miles during the summer. Um, not to be repeated, but um, it did get me from A to B. Um, but yeah, 10,000 miles, uh, yeah, took, took its toll on my car. And so now I want to tell you about um, a one particular story where this really did, um, yeah, not the best thing for my car in the world. So I was, uh, the star of this story is up in, in Newcastle in Northumberland. Um, I had been staying overnight in Yorkshire, just south of there. Um, I had been to see the Lady Slipper and was absolutely thrilled to find this incredibly beautiful rare orchid. And I had this one trip, which was going to take two days. So it was an overnight trip up to Northumberland to find two orchids. One of them was this one, the Coral Root Orchid. So uh, the night before I set off from Yorkshire um, to go up to Newcastle, I my phone died. Um, no matter what I tried, it wouldn't turn on again. And so I used the landline to call uh, my family. We're back down in Wiltshire in the south. Um, and I was like, look, my phone's died. I've got this two day trip and then I'm like coming home. Um, what should I do basically? And my dad was like, oh, okay, Liv, you know, just go to the supermarket in the morning and um, go to the phone section, just buy yourself like a cheap phone. And you know, that'll cover you until you get home. So I was like, great, no problems. So in the morning I went to Sainsbury's and I went to the phone section and the cheapest one they had was 70 pounds. And I stood there thinking, you know what? I don't want to spend 70 pounds on a phone that I'm going to be using for a few days. Um, I just can't afford that. And so I was like, oh, I'll risk it. What's the worst that could happen? It'll be fine. In that way you do when you're a teenager and you don't really think about things. So I drove up to Newcastle. Um, it was all very smooth. I got to um, Gosforth Park in the north of Newcastle and uh, went off exploring to find the coral root orchid. I got very lucky because the reserve warden was just happened to be by the front gate and so took me directly to them. Um, which was brilliant because I would never have found them by myself. Um, so I saw those and got back to the car in time for lunch and was sat there in the car eating my lunch, feeling rather smug because I was thinking that was so easy. This is one of the hardest plants to find on my list and I just immediately found it. And I was thinking, you know what, I can probably go and see the lesser tway blade, which is the other species I had to see um, and actually get back to Yorkshire this evening saving myself some money on the campsites overnight. So I was, I was pretty pleased with myself. So I got back in the car, got back onto the motorway. I was driving through Newcastle on the motorway when my car, my wonderful old car, 
um, just started uh, juddering, really, really violently juddering. Um, and then there was this awful grating sound in the engine. Um, I lost all power. So, you know, I couldn't speed up. Um, the power steering went. Very luckily, there was no one else in the other lane. So I was able to get over into the hard shoulder, came to a halt, turned the engine off, um, and was like, okay, I'm now in this situation where my car, while it will still turn on, has it's not in a good way. Um, I don't have a phone. And I'm not entirely sure what to do. And so I got out of the car and uh, gathered some things with me and walked along the side of the motorway to try and find one of those um, orange SOS phones. Uh, but I couldn't find one, eventually got to like a slip road. So I walked up the slip road, clambered onto the walkway, walked over the motorway and into Newcastle uh, to find a payphone. I eventually found one um, and discovered at that point that I only had enough change you know again being 19 not really thinking these things through I only had enough change uh, for one phone call and um, so I could either call the AA or as I did I could call my family and um, so I called home and it was just the biggest relief in the world to hear my dad's voice crackling at the other end of the line and I was like dad you know you'll never guess what happened my car's basically broken down I still turn on but it's not great I don't have a phone like what should I do and he was like Leif it's okay it's okay all you have to do is go back to the car um your campsite is like a couple of miles away so just get yourself there um, and we can sort everything out once you're there so that really calmed me down so I went back to the car, got back in, got back onto the motorway. The car at this point was sounding absolutely fine. And I was thinking this might actually work. Um, another mile down the motorway, came off on a slip road. And it was one of those really wide uh, four lane slip roads. And I stop at the top of the traffic lights. Uh, the traffic lights turn green. I start uh, trying to move forward, um, but the car stalls. I try and turn it on and it just won't turn on at all. So now I'm in the middle of a four lane slip road at rush hour with cars bombing past me on either side, going around the roundabout. And I don't have a phone and I have absolutely no idea what to do, just not a clue. And so I just sit there in this car that won't start with everyone racing past. Now, luckily they have security cameras on the motorway. And so 10 minutes later, um, the traffic police turned up and um, kindly towed me onto the uh, roundabout. Um, and the guy, after giving me a bit of a lecture for not being able to, um, he, he wanted me to like attach my own car to the truck. It was all very confusing. Um, but he very kindly lent me his phone. And so I called my dad again. I was like, Dad, now this has happened. I just, I don't know what to do. And like, how could this day get any worse? Um, and he was like, look, okay, Leif, you've got one option here, I'm afraid, and that's to call the AA and uh, get towed um, all the way back to Wiltshire. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, and so the AA towed me back through the night and various overnight people dropping me off at different service stations. Um, but I was really, really sad because the orchid, which I was about to go and see, the lesser tway blade, um, I'd left it a bit late and so only had a couple of days left before they'd mostly have stopped flowering. So we got back at eight o'clock in the morning. I was exhausted because I'd been listening to very awake um, AA people chattering to me all night. Um, and I got back convinced that my, my trip was over. Um, got into bed and I was like, I'm just, I just need to go to sleep. So it was with some annoyance that a few hours later, I was found myself being woken up by my dad. Um, and he was like, Leif, Leif, wake up. And I was like, dad, you know, I just don't want to get out of bed right now. I, you know, I'm really bummed out. I've ruined my whole trip. You know, I just want to sleep. And he was like, no, Leif, it's Father's Day. You need to get up because we're going to have a nice Father's Day lunch. Uh, all together and then you and I are going to drive all the way back up to Newcastle and we're going to find that orchid and I just couldn't believe it I was suddenly very awake 
as you can imagine. And um, yeah, that's exactly what we did. We had lunch uh, and dad then drove me all the way back up to Newcastle. And um, uh, yes, here's a photo of my lovely car, which I loved very much. Uh, halfway down the motorway, it, it's sort of three o'clock in the morning. Um, yes, yeah, so we arrived um, on this moorland just outside of Newcastle. Um, there's a wonderful picture of the two of us with our excellent fashion sense. <laughs> and yeah, we spent about 10 minutes on this moorland um, before I found a lesser toy blade, which is this one on the left here. And my dad um, took, <laughs> took one look at this plant and he said, Leif, are you serious? We have just driven all this way um, to come and see that this thing is like five centimeters tall, um, reddish brown, as you can see, you can barely even see the flowers on it. And he was like, yeah, I just can't believe it. But he could see how happy it made me. Um, my quest was back on, I had not failed. Um, but yeah, he single handedly saved my summer. Um, and it was yeah one of the best Father's Days we ever had. So that was really, really good. Um, yes, one of the more um, exciting adventures from the book. So I would just like to finish um, by talking about one of my other favorite orchids, um, the burnt orchid, which is this, again, tiny plant. It looks enormous from these photos, but it's only about 10 centimeters tall. Um, a little bit of context for this one. Um, it's a plant which generally grows on nice old chalk grassland or limestone grassland um, and Wiltshire where I lived um, was a real hot spot for it is a real hot spot for it and so I'd seen this one many times before um, it's yeah became one of my favorites very early on and I was never worried about not seeing this one but when it came to my gap year I went to look for it twice at two different places and completely failed I uh, couldn't find any sign of any plants um, whatsoever. And so I was left with uh, one day where I had to go and find a burnt orchid because uh, the next day I was driving up to Yorkshire and Lancashire to go and find uh, the lady's slipper and various other orchids. And so this really was uh, my last opportunity to find this one. Now, I came across many, many problems um, on this year. You've just heard about my car. Um, but the problem I had on this one was slightly more unique. Um, but yes, I will read, read to you uh, the events of, of finding the burnt orchid. The following afternoon, I drove through Salisbury once again, heading west towards Martin Down as I'd done the previous day. It was my last chance to see a burnt orchid before heading off to Yorkshire. So I decided to try a nature reserve near Coombe Bissett. I knew before I started that this had to be a quick visit as it was my mother's 50th birthday. Several weeks before she had issued strict instructions to keep her birthday free and ensure I could be around to help with the celebrations. I agreed to this without hesitating. No orchid hunting on the 9th. That was that, no problem. By lucky coincidence, I wasn't up a mountain somewhere on the other side of the country when the time came. However, I'd also expected to have found the burnt orchid by now. So that afternoon, once all the guests had arrived at our house and I'd plied my mother with several glasses of champagne, I quietly slipped away. I would be back before she noticed anyway. I turned off by the small church in Coombisset and scaled the hill almost missing the car park as I admired the lane side display of doily flowered Queen Anne's lace. I love this time of year when rural country lanes are lined with this white umbellifer. Still dressed in my suit and tie, I grabbed my bag from the back seat and locked the car. I headed off down the hill, surrounded by the dull green of arable fields. Coombis it down as a hidden valley that has escaped modern day agriculture its slopes are too steep for machinery, which mercifully has meant that it's been grazed annually by sheep during the winter, allowing the grassland to thrive. The path, surrounded on both sides by a buttery wash of bulbous buttercups, 
and common rock roses curved its way down to the valley bottom. I dilly-dallied along the path, marvelling at the wildflowers tripping over one another in their abundance. First came the small red-purple flowers of hound's tongue, then horseshoe vetch in droves, irresistibly delicate quaking grass and bobbed heads of salad burnet. Burnt orchids wouldn't want to grow anywhere else. I paused, looking down at my ridiculous orchid hunting outfit. Please don't let me be discovered here, I thought. But with the ticking clock in mind, I hesitated no longer and plunged into the long grass. I made my way along the hillside, about a third of the way up, following one of the terracettes around the contour of the slope. These slumped almost paths make steep pastures look rippled like a beach at low tide. It was the perfect place for burnt orchids. Removing my jacket, I set about searching, enjoying the warmth of the afternoon sun on my shoulders. There were sheep in the adjacent field outside the reserve, and a lamb stood bawling in the middle, its mother responding from a corner by the woods. I scanned the shorter patches of grass and spotted a white flower spike, the top few flowers scorched deep red. Here, at last, was a burnt orchid. Burnt orchids, or burnt tip orchids as they are sometimes known, are tiny intricate works of art. Usually no more than 10 centimetres tall, they are a wonderful sight amongst the grasses as the beautifully rich claret of the buds fades into white down the inflorescence. Some plants are tipped with a pale burgundy, others a deep wine red. Turning to my right, I let out a low whistle and walked over to an unusually large spike with a tall inflorescence holding at least 40 flowers. Each petal resembled a dwarfed figure as white as the chalk they rose from. The origin of the burnt orchid's Latin name, Neotinia ostulata, is debated. Some argue that it is named after a Sicilian botanist called Vincenzo Tinio, while others believe it refers to the supposed similarity to the African genus Tinia. Its species name, Ustulata, scorched looking or to burn, clearly refers to the dark color of the unopened buds. I wondered guiltily about the party back at home and quickly checked my phone. Just one text from my father. Where are you? I grabbed my camera and stuffed it back in my bag. As I pulled my jacket on, I made my way down to the bottom of the slope where I realized I was being watched by a woman and her dogs from the path. Stopping the dogs, she asked what I was doing and whether I was studying plants. Her whole face lit up when she heard that I was looking for orchids. It's so nice to meet someone else who's looking for what you're looking for, she said. It turned out she lived in the village and enjoyed bringing the dogs here so that she could watch the orchids as they came out every year. I felt my phone buzz. Leif, seriously, where are you? She was giving me directions to a grassy bank within Salisbury Hospital that had sprouted 60 bee orchids the previous year. I was hurriedly noting down her instructions. You better not be orchid hunting. These bee orchids sounded huge. Some had had eight or nine flowers. I just had to get the details down. After another couple of minutes, once I had made her confusing descriptions legible, I made my excuses and began jogging back to the car. Inexplicably, she hadn't asked me about my suit. I arrived home and parked my car across the road. I ran up the drive and ran the side of the house, hoping to avoid my father until I could make it obvious I'd been there the entire time. Straightening my jacket, I glided back into the party. I thought I'd seamlessly integrated myself, until I bumped into my parents, who took one look at me and then almost in unison asked, how could you? I glanced down at my disheveled tie, crumpled shoes, tr crumpled trousers and mud scuffed shoes. Perhaps it would have been a good idea to change. It didn't matter though, I'd seen the burnt orchid. So you'll be glad to hear that's the end of me talking. Um, thank you so much again for uh, coming along this evening and giving me your Wednesday evening. Um, I hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And yeah, if you do want to go and buy the book, um, then it's available from all good online bookshops. So yeah, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Leif. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, that was very good. We, we're giving you a virtual round of applause while we're um, uh, uh, here. Um, so um, we've had um, uh, lots of uh, questions come in for you uh, while uh, you've been talking. So I'll read some of them out. Excellent. Um, the um, uh, uh, first one um, uh, from Nonny, um, since you wrote your book, have you found any new orchids? Um, not in the UK. Um, luckily, I was managed, managed to get most of them here in the UK. Um, I have seen some new orchids. Um, luckily, part of my, my, my PhD was based down in the south of France. Um, so I had uh, two weeks there in May, both 2019 and 2018. And so while I was looking for uh, man, monkey, lady and military orchids, which were the ones um, I was studying, uh, yes, I came across various new species, um, lots which are related to the bee orchid, uh, so another, another, other insect mimicking species. Um, so yes, I have added to my sort of global tally since then. So you've gone, you've gone global. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Jeff, Jeff actually asked the question as well. Could you tell us a bit about your PhD project? Absolutely, yes. Um, so yeah, I've spent the last um, four years studying um, these orchids whose petals look like little people. So the man orchid, which is wonderfully demonstrated behind Alan here. Um, then yes, the lady orchid, the monkey orchid and the military orchid. Um, I've always been completely fascinated by these just because um, of what they look like. And the thing I've been looking at um, has been the hybrids between these species. So um, there's this very famous site in Oxfordshire called Hartslock, where monkey orchids and lady orchids have produced, they reproduced together and they formed these intermediate plants, uh, which is like half lady orchid, half monkey orchid. Um, and I, my PhD has been working out um, what's going on with the genetics, uh, whether it's possible for those hybrids to then reproduce further with monkey orchids or with lady orchids. And so I've been, yeah, been down to the south of France where these plants are a lot more common, um, did a load of sampling there um, and have been, yeah, basically working out in different species combinations, um, whether the hybrids are fertile or not. Um, and so it looks like uh, I haven't, I, my papers are currently waiting. Um, they've been submitted, but haven't yet been accepted. Um, so I can't point you in the direction of the papers, but um, basically what we seem to have found is that um, hybrids between man and monkey orchids, between lady and monkey orchids, and between lady and military orchids, um, all of the hybrids are fertile to some extent. Um, I've also done some phylogenetics and um, shown that the lady and military orchids are more closely related to each other than they are to monkey orchids, um, which is very satisfying because all the um, genetic work done so far has been very inconclusive about who's more closely related to whom. Um, so yeah, I'm feeling particularly pleased about that. Um, but yes, basically when, as soon as my papers are published, I'm planning to write um, sort of a blog articles uh, for each paper to sort of summarize it for the general public. So uh, if you want more information, that would be the place to go. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and Alan, um, not, uh, not me, uh, a former colleague of mine, hello Alan, um, wants to know, apart from the bee orchid, are there any other examples of orchids which have abandoned their pollinators? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure. So there are there are other species that self pollinate. Um, many of the hellebrines, for example, will do that. Um, particularly plants, you know, plants that take it to the extreme are things like the green flowered hellebrine, which often um, the flower buds don't always open. They sort of pollinate themselves before they even open, so they they never actually open. Um, but as far as I'm aware, and I could be completely wrong here, um, but as far as I'm aware, um, there aren't any other examples of um, orchids having to self-pollinate because they've lost their pollinators. But as I say, um, yeah, I'm only aware of so many orchids, so I'm sure there'll be examples uh, somewhere. 
Um, Jane has asked whether any of the orchids were actually a disappointment when you found them. Oh, I've, I've never been asked that question before. Um, very good. <laughs> um, well, no, to be honest, no. Um, I was just so completely obsessed with them that they could never have been disappointing. Um, some of them were, well, a lot of them were considerably smaller than I was expecting. I think when you when you see them in the photos, when they're all close up, they obviously look enormous. Um, and so I, the man orchid was a good example of that. Um, I was expecting to find something much, much bigger. Um, so yeah, not disappointing, just perhaps different uh, to what I was expecting. Yeah, that, that's a, that's, I think that's quite a common reaction, it, realizing how tiny and intricate some of these things are. Um, this is possibly the most important question of the night from Shona. Um, what happened to the car? Have you still got it? <laughs> oh, my car. So my car, um, the, the mechanic basically, so he, the mechanic who had brought it back to life on about four or five different occasions before that, um, basically said, look, you know, at this stage, it's just not worth it. It's going to be too expensive. Um, so I had to sell it for scrap which was a great shame. Um, and then, yeah, basically bought a new second-hand car uh, for the remainder of the summer before selling that one again. Um, so yeah, sadly it, it went for scrap, but it will always, um, you know, it will remain uh, in the Orchid Hunter and remain in my memory. So I was very fond of it. <laughs> uh, and, and Rhiannon wants to know um, what's next? Uh, have you got any projects for 2021? Uh, that might be completing a PhD, I might imagine. Um, and also um, quest a comment from um, Ian about what, what, what you plan on doing after your PhD. Um, so, yes, so yeah, first, first job is to um, get this Viva out of the way. Um, it's at the end of the month, so it won't be too long before good, I... Good luck. That. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so I've got to do that. Um, I'm afraid I'm not allowed to tell you what I'm actually doing next. Okay. Um, it's right. very exciting and I'm very excited to tell you all about it. Um, and it will be very soon that I'll be able to tell you about it. Um, but as uh, of this moment, I'm sworn to secrecy, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, it won't be long before I can uh, tell you all about that. Well, that, that can be your um, uh, next uh, talk, obviously. There we uh, go. And just we'll, we'll, we'll just finish off. We've got an absolute corker of a question from Andy and Lucy. Uh, <laughs> I think the question we uh, many of us have asked ourselves, have you seen the ghost orchid? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I have not seen the ghost orchid. How, so... many, how many of us have? <laughs> hey, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, people are always telling me they've seen the ghost orchid, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And it's been very frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the number of orchids in this country is not a black and white number. Um, it lies somewhere between 50 and 60. And so at the beginning of this year, I basically drew up this list, um, a list to sort of aim for. And I came to the total of 52. I left out um, the ghost orchids because the last two sightings were in 2009, uh, which was only four years previously, um, and 1987, I think, was the one before that. And so if I'd added the ghost orchid to my list, I was basically setting myself up for failure. Um, I went to look for it anyway. I spent about 10 hours, I think, over the course of uh, several weeks. Um, just hunting around some this empty woodland for the ghost orchid. Um, but yeah, I didn't manage to find it. It would have been a bonus number 53. You're, you're, um, you're not the only one who's failed to find it. Yeah. But, it but if it's any consolation, Andy and Lucy say they have seen the ghost orchid in 1983. <laughs> so well well, oh, done. well, I'm very pleased for you. <laughs> well done, Andy and Lucy. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're we're I we're I will, we're coming to the end. Uh, we will finish up very shortly. Um, so I'd just like to remind you that uh, Leaf's book, uh, The Orchid Hunter, as he said, available from uh, all good uh, online uh, bookshops. Leaf's also the co-author of the Eight Gap Guide to Winter Trees and Shrubs. So that's uh, seasonally appropriate. Do you want to tell us anything about that one? Yeah, um, this one. Um, came out in 2013 and it's basically a beginner's guide to identifying deciduous trees in the winter when they don't have any leaves on and um, so basically it cuts out all the rare 
trees that you'd never see um, and just focuses on the really common things which you'll find in woods and hedgerows around the country um, and it's a photographic guide so um, I spent hours and hours and hours you know with freezing fingers taking all these photos of buds and bark and all sorts of twigs and things um, so they're all in there um, there's also a free um, key which you can, which I've written, um, which you can download from the Species Recovery Trust website uh, for free. So yeah, that's great. Um, Thanks. Yeah, uh, and there's there's one more I thought I would also mention. I suspect we'll all be doing uh, uh, more reading until lockdown is over and the snow is gone and the orchid season is on us. Uh, I'm I'm sure you know this one, Leif. Um, uh, and it's mm -hmm. some of the background to some of the work you've talked about, particularly about the bee orchid. Uh, yes. But if anyone's not read this book, Darwin's Orchids Then and Now, uh, that's a that's a fantastic read um, about some of Darwin's work and and the sort of beginnings of orchidology uh, in a way. So um, uh, definitely recommend that one if anyone is uh, uh, try, trying to fill the hours until lockdown is over. I would recommend that one. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to hand over to our uh, chair, uh, Hazel, to just finish off the evening. Hello, everybody. Um, Leif, I'm, sh I'm sure I speak for everybody who's been listening tonight. Um, that was absolutely lovely. We, it was so, so enjoyable to see your enthusiasm, to see what the flowers, the plants you've seen, the, um, the effort you made into going to look for them. It was absolutely brilliant. I, I read your book a few years ago and um, your descriptions of some of the places you've been to were so vivid. Um, quite a few of the places I'd actually visited at any rate. And, and it brought, your, your writing just brought them back to me. And I also love the way in the book that you mentioned, well, as we say, the giants whose shoulders the modern botanists are all standing on. You had obviously done a lot of homework. You um, had a lot of information about the background to all of this. Um, and well, I think what you, you were able to do going around the country I mean, it must have been a fabulous experience. And I think lots of people um, using your book could use some of the information in it to actually go and look for some of these themselves. Um, I, I just have got to say that you were very lucky to actually have the chance to do that. There's so many poor young people of a similar age to you who, who've totally missed out on the chance to do what you were able to do. And with any luck, perhaps the next few years the young people will be able to go out and do it again because it was such a lovely thing that you did and your book is such a beautiful read and I would heartily recommend it to everybody so thank you thank you very much for such an entertaining evening thank you oh that's so kind thank you so much that's really lovely I'm so pleased you've enjoyed it